Thank you, and uh, excellent to be in uh, this event uh, talking with you. And uh, you saw a little bit before the impact certificates. So obviously, it's a very new thing for me. So uh, it uh, seems like scientifically reasonable thing to do to first try something on oneself uh, rather than on somebody else. So uh, apart from being a researcher in uh, finance, I also studied at university level art. So I kind of um, put there as an impact certificate that's uh, music art projects that we have uh, with um, my husband. And it is uh, a very interesting community itself as well. So modular synth involves uh, people using different sets of modules that modify the sound. And they are then patched together. So obviously, this thing is never going to produce something similar. Different artists will not produce something similar. It is. Uh, a uh, lot more flexible than a synthesizer that has like a set of functions in uh, build. And there are exciting modular music communities in uh, New York, of course, in Montreal as well, where we are based around the world. During COVID times, there were great uh, virtual events as well. And then in addition, our project, like uh, while the music is happening, I'm doing uh, live digital art. So you could check it out. Hopefully, we'll have a concert in London sometime soon. But now, going to the topic of my talk, it is about uh, crowdfunding. And I'm going to put on now my Finance Economist Act uh, hat. And I'm uh, going to assume not cis communities, but uh, very self-interested uh, individuals. And what I'm going to talk about in particular is uh, reward-based uh, crowdfunding that is now uh, over 10 years old. But it is uh, very much related to the other fundraising mechanisms that uh, have emerged and are emerging, uh, also in digital space, like initial uh, coin offerings. Um, even so, this term is probably not uh, very popular anymore. We can call them consumer token offerings. There is a natural connection with NFTs and many other initiatives that um, this uh, conference is about. And the key idea is that what makes it uh, different from other sources of crowdfunding, which in the broadest term just would involve some uh, crowd <laughs> giving some funds to somebody. What is interesting about reward-based crowdfunding is the fact that uh, expectation is to be receiving uh, some non-financial reward. Typically, it is a promise to receive a product or service uh, sometime at a future date. And what is fascinating about it is, of course, the fact that at the time of asking these funds, like uh, it is possible and uh, likely that the product or service doesn't uh, yet exist. Okay? So in a, in a way, it is uh, uh, proposing something very new compared to like hundreds of uh, thousands of years. Oh, okay, maybe it is less than thousands of years. But like uh, financing, where uh, normally what we would have is that somebody has a great idea. They have a, a need for uh, investment. And they would need to reach out to some uh, financial uh, investors, be it uh, banks, be it uh, venture capitalists and then hopefully develops their idea, and then long time later on try to sell it to the consumers and find out whether anybody wants the things that was created to start with. Okay, and uh, in this case, when we are thinking of innovative ideas, there are particular difficulties to get uh, financing because these projects often don't have tangible assets that you can collateralize, no stable cash flows. Uh, things like uh, debt contracts are probably not optimal because these projects may, with a high probability, fail. And in this case, uh, the financiers will not uh, get anything. In the case of success, they would get a small interest rate, which I guess in this case would need to be enormous. So it's natural that the investors would want to have some uh, bigger upside in the case of uh, success. And then, because of this intangibility as well, like there are a lot of... Uh, problems with aligning the incentives, because the entrepreneurs themselves or artists may know better how able they are to create some things than outside investors. They may have incentives to not develop the product, to just get financing and um, enjoy um, uh, it without putting in enough uh, effort and so on. So it's very difficult to align the incentives there. Hence, a uh, lot of good projects end up being not uh, financed 
because there are not enough venture capitalists for all good ideas. And in contrast, in the case of reward-based funding, like as I said before, there is a, a promise of interaction with a direct con uh, directly with the consumers of the firm itself, because eventually these are the people that are going to generate the cash flows that would be also needed for uh, paying back to these investors made in the previous uh, uh, slide. So, uh, of course, these investors, uh, so these uh, individuals, they could either provide enough funding for the project's uh, investment, or it could be still some need for the traditional financial contracts and players there. And what is, uh, we all know that like reward-based crowdfunding works like pretty well. Actually, the cases of obvious fraud are very rare there but it looks like almost on a superficial uh, site uh, too good to be true. Because as a firm, it looks like an excellent deal. I can get uh, money. I don't have to give up even some ownership of my shares, right? Uh, I will be eventually selling the product to my um, uh, future consumers like before I even uh, produce it. So it looks like an excellent uh, uh, way to uh, uh, finance uh, something, while at the same time uh, it would be potentially uh, risky for the consumers participating in it, like because very possibly they are not gonna get uh, anything unless the uh, incentives are aligned in uh, in uh, this uh, sort of uh, system. So related to that. Uh, uh, we were working on the research to try to understand uh, why does reward-based uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, work. Because we know that the venture capital financing contracts are uh, rather complicated to align the incentives using the convertible assets, having the venture capitalists uh, closely engaged with managing the firms and so on. So there is a lot of thing happening there to align the investments. And now with the crowdfunding, we just have individuals that are not associated with the firm or potentially even in a different country, somehow um, managing to overcome this incentive uh, problem. And so the greatest issue is that what, uh, what, uh, how does uh, crowdfunding seeming to be uh, overcome the moral hazard problem, which is just telling the entrepreneur could uh, have a crowdfunding uh, campaign, get money, and uh, then not produce anything, telling that things just didn't work out. And it's like extremely difficult for these investors, potentially in different places uh, around the world, uh, uh, having a small amount of money placed in the project to take some uh, action to uh, win um, this thing in the court, especially uh, if there can be good reasons that the project uh, didn't uh, um, work out rather than fail. Okay, so related to that, we have this uh, theoretical research paper with uh, Professor uh, Gilles Schemler, who is uh, in Imperial College London. And uh, we are asking there that what is a source of value creation in this, uh, I should be specific, reward-based uh, crowdfunding. Uh, what types of firms would benefit most of it? And how do we overcome this incentive problems that I just uh, uh, mentioned? And additionally, our model talks to the case of why is it useful to have third-party platforms there. So why is it, for many firms, not necessarily a good idea to run a crowdfunding uh, platform on their own website, for example. And it's uh, going to be potentially uh, not too uh, surprising because it is commonly understood in the community that one benefit of reward-based crowdfunding is that it enables to test out the market, to find out whether there is a demand for the product to be uh, created. And this aspect actually turns out to be uh, important, not just about learning about demand, but also to the moral hazard uh, problems that I will uh, mention. And what is the benefit about learning about demand? It is it's giving uh, what uh, we call real option value, uh, which is enabling better investment decisions. So in a way, as a firm, I'm happy in both ways. I might run the campaign, and I learn that there is, I say, enough, or even in a good case, more demand for my products than I expected, etc. So I'm very happy to invest. 
I'm also happy if uh, it turns out there is very little demand for my uh, product because at least I'm going to save investment costs and time of effort by knowing that it's probably the case that my consumers are not going to value this uh, product, so it's no point in uh, developing it. So the real option value of learning is here going in the, um, both uh, cases. And second, I will uh, show that like what uh, this uh, value of learning does, it is also what uh, mitigates a moral hazard. So in this uh, model, we allow the entrepreneurs to run away with the money they raise in crowdfunding at no cost whatsoever. Of course, in reality, there could be reputation costs, uh, more uh, uh, cooperative uh, entrepreneurs, and it's less likely, but that is like an extra bonus. So if something works in a case that we make uh, 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 the assumptions that everybody is extremely self-interested, uh, then it is certainly going to uh, work even better in the case that it's uh, not totally uh, the case. Case. And what is also like uh, very much a feature of like uh, many crowdfunding campaigns is a campaign lens uh, tend to be short. And actually, the shorter campaigns have been empirically shown to be more likely uh, uh, to succeed. So. Again, a superficial way would be to attribute it to um, uh, short campaigns involving some sort of enthusiasm, so which can definitely be a part of the story. But in our setting, where the short campaigns are crucial because of this Mora has a problem, because it is uh, what enables uh, to overcome the line, uh, say, uh, incentive problem. So, namely, suppose that I have raised uh, one million of uh, funds like during uh, my crowdfunding campaign, but if after that I think that in the aftermarket I'm going to sell for five million, I don't want to run away with this one million uh, ex ante and give up the, the um, five million. Okay, so in that sense, like this is a, this is. Um, uh, ways that we argue that uh, the reward-based uh, crowdfunding um, overcomes a moral hazard problem. But it, of course, has a bit of uh, implications of what sort of products can benefit from uh, crowdfunding. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the full proofs and the details of the model, but I think that it is still uh, useful to highlight the uh, uh, simplest uh, setting to emphasize the same uh, arguments that I just uh, made. So in this setting, uh, imagine that the firm has identified its target market, so it has in potential consumers, and some of them, an unknown fraction of them, will... Uh, want to buy the product because they like the product. And what is uh, technically cool is that uh, mm, it's actually very useful to use a beta distribution here because uh, that can allow the prior beliefs about the demand to take any sort of form. So here it is like uh, some examples of uh, what beta distribution uh, can look like. So here the firm, uh, for example, thinks that uh, uh, so these are distribution functions, and this in the horizontal axis is a share of customers in the target market who values the product. So it could be relatively concentrated in the uh, middle, so the firm expects like there to be 50% uh, uh, of the target market uh, wanting to buy the product, but it could end up being here as well, but with a lower probability. So obviously this case involves less uncertainty than this U-shaped uh, case, and obviously things don't need to be symmetric, and this is a very flexible distribution. So what is crucial here and what is uncertainty about is the fact that we don't know exactly what this fraction exactly is. So that is something that we can learn about uh, 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 during the crowdfunding uh, campaign. Okay, and then uh, after that, uh, so there will be like the interaction between the consumers in the market or the agents and the firm. Everybody is rational and risk neutral. It would be even extra benefits if the firm is uh, uh, risk averse because we have reduction of uncertainty, but uh, let's make it uh, risk neutral. And so then there is a crowdfunding at some uh, date and some fraction of the consumers will, have be, will be reached during the campaign. And it is turning out to be crucial that we can't be trying to sell to all our target market because after that uh, there would be in our setting an obvious case for just taking the money and uh, running away. 
rather than producing anything, because money is already there, why bother? And we also have consumers that have choices. They don't need to buy the product that's a crowdfunding campaign, so you have a choice. Uh, even if they like the product, they could delay and buy it when it already exists, rather than in the earlier case. Uh, okay, and then the firm has a choice whether to invest or not, and uh, it uh, then invests and produces it at uh, day two. So we are aiming to solve here the perfect patient equilibrium of this game and also figure out like the other features of uh, the optimal mechanism. So should it be all or nothing, like for example Kickstarter, should it be that the firm keeps all funds raised and um, so on. Okay. So I'm going to just illustrate uh, the two equations that are highlighting the ideas that I already said. So one uh, is a good parallel to crowdfunding. Uh, in our opinion, is to compare it to the frictionless consumer survey. So suppose that I could get the part of my target market and ask them whether they like my product uh, or not, and then uh, make uh, update my beliefs uh, based on that. Of course, the problem uh, is that is there. It's like these people could just as well tell me they like the product without any intention of ever buying it. And you would never do it in crowdfunding because you're actually risking your own money, so you would not pledge for a project that, uh, that uh, you don't uh, value. So based on uh, this frictionless service that uh, is a benchmark, the project's uh, NPV would be pretty simple. So these are like, suppose that little M consumers uh, have said that they like the product, so I know them. This is off the market, so these are the ones that I'm having in my target market and haven't yet uh, reached, that I'm hoping to sell in the future and I am uh, updating my beliefs about how much demand for my product uh, there is. Okay, so if uh, this is non-negative, I will invest and things are good. So here are just some examples about like, so how the updates would be uh, uh, updated, uh, sorry, the beliefs would be updated here. So again, share of customers here, probability distributions here, so the black one is here, the prior beliefs. And uh, if I get uh, more than my ex-ante expectations of people uh, uh, telling that they like my product here, I'm going to increase like my expectations. So this is blue here, so I beliefs have gone up. And that's why I said that risk aversion would be working in the good direction as well, because uncertainty is uh, reduced because we have this distribution much more concentrated. Of course, I could also get a negative news, so this is my initial beliefs about my target market, but it turned out to be uh, less than that, so I would have updated my beliefs here. So what is uh, the case here that one can show that, like, the type of firms in terms of um, their finances, the ones that would benefit most from uh, crowdfunding are the ones that are just at the verge of breaking even based on the prior beliefs. So if I don't know, whether my project is worth it or not, uh, then it is most valuable to test it out in a crowdfunding. So if it is uh, that I'm very certain of my product, it's very unlikely to change my mind as a crowdfunding outcome. And so if I can get financing from other sources, like there is no need to do it. And second, pretty intuitively as well, is that the value of learning is highest for firms that face the greatest demand uncertainty, which fits very well together, for example, in Kickstarter's uh, projects that uh, getting most attention are the technology gadgets rather than things like food, because it's still developing a new uh, technology gadget is uh, noticeably uh, more uncertain whether there is a demand than a restaurant where I can just compare it with something reasonably uh, similar. Okay, and what is also crucial and like one needs to keep in mind in terms of testing the uh, demand is that uh, uh, what gives uh, later on the incentives to, rep to continue with the project is that I have to update my beliefs about the uh, aftermarket. So if my crowdfunding crowd is very different from the ones that I'm going to try to sell later or engage later, it's not going to give me information, it's actually going to make some moral hazard problem worse. So if I can get financing from somewhere else, it's a better thing to do. To give an example, without uh, mentioning a concrete uh, company's names in the crowdfunding campaign, 
they also aim to find out whether there is a developer interest in uh, uh, around the technology products that um, they were creating and it would be necessary for the product. Okay, so then there uh, uh, some people bought the developer version of the product and it would be potentially seen as a good news, but it wasn't like probably the right developer market to attract because it would be maybe the people who just wanted for their personal use to play with the gadget rather than the ones that would be providing the programs or applications for the overall ecosystem, right? So this is one example of, uh, of uh, the crowdfunding sample being uh, different from the actual target market we want to learn about, so they better be uh, the same, because as I'm going to show the equation again, uh, that is highlighting the incentive issue here, is that when we can uh, uh, disappear with the funds at no costs, and we are comparing like these two objects, so this is similar to the NPV before in the case that I invest. Okay, so I'm going to raise that much money during the campaign. I'm going to update my beliefs about uh, future demand. I'm going to subtract the investment cost, and now I'm going to compare it with just taking the money that I have raised uh, and um, and uh, uh, running away with it. So, so given that, uh, overcoming the moral hazard problem requires like this. It requires the aftermarket covering the investment cost uh, that is going to give me the incentives. So, of course, if nothing would have been changing here because of uh, learning from these new consumers, then the crowdfunding can easily become uh, um, uh, uh, problematic and like not uh, credible. So what we are here, this uh, is nicely showing that we need to keep uh, large enough off the market, hence connection with the short campaigns, and we will need to uh, have our beliefs changing based on the uh, campaigns. So as a practical thing, the campaigns that have ambitious uh, targets, uh, and then all of nothing game means this, all of nothing mechanism means this uh, system turns out to be optimal. Okay, so um, in the model, we uh, would allow also them to set any target or um, not to set the target at all, but it turns out to be optimal to set the target which will uh, incentivize a firm to invest, provided that they get uh, financing. And this trial target would need to be uh, somewhat. Uh, high, so reason to be suspicious about the targets that are like one dollar or something. Okay. And then it is also uh, relating to the idea that why do we need uh, third-party platforms? Because they facilitate commitment to short campaigns. So I ran it on my own website. Things don't go uh, well. Well, first I could just lie about the demand, telling that I have like sold uh, thousands of units while I have sold uh, five. And second, there is a little, very little reason of doing it in the own campaign to uh, own the uh, website to. Um, uh, keep the campaign uh, running forever, hoping that some more people will pledge money. I have no intention to invest anymore, and I'm going to just aim to divert all these things. Okay? And uh, this uh, statistically kind of also very nicely relates to the observations in uh, this campaign that, for example, if you are looking at the technology projects that uh, have the greatest uncertainty, arguably, then conditional on uh, the project being funded, actually the campaigns are often massively overfunded, which is uh, interesting because if you would have an interpretation that there is some sort of charity aspect dominating it, then why are the investors giving them money more than a firm uh, needs like several times? So we can see here that uh, uh, if we look at this uh, distributions, then uh, about 10% of campaigns get like five times uh, more money than they set uh, target for. And this is true even if we exclude uh, projects which have like ridiculously small target, which would be, um, uh, so this thing is not uh, driving the results. Of course, uh, and the technology, one way to look at like how much uncertainty there is to look at this uh, different uh, figures, but as I don't have too much time, I'm going to skip it. Just to highlight here, we are contrasting here the uncertainty in terms of the distributions, now not only looking at the successful campaigns, but all, but uh, the technology, 
which is blue, and theata, which is um, one of the less popular categories in uh, uh, Kickstarter, for example. Since uh, so overall distributions, like in terms of second order stochastic uh, dominance, we would see that the theater indeed, sorry, the technology indeed uh, involves greater uncertainty. So if successful technology projects raise multiple times over uh, the money, uh, the targets they raise, but they are also more likely to fail and uh, not uh, reach a uh, target uh, 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 funds. So this has. Uh, uh, these uh, predictions are very much consistent with uh, with interpreting crowdfunding like that. Okay, and so as a during the last few mi minutes, I'm gonna uh, mention uh, what I said at the beginning that there are other initiatives, especially in the digital uh, space, that are somewhat similar to the crowdfunding, and there are other positives that like digital. Mm, interaction can uh, uh, enable. So uh, one thing also uh, mentioned in uh, some other crowdfunding re and ICO related papers um, uh, by recent authors. So the uh, fact that this uh, in the case of uh, something like ICOs uh, or like especially utility tokens, uh, in addition to learning about demand of individuals for a product, like we can learn also about whether there is a network effect which is necessary for many platform businesses and maybe even create a network effect. Depending on the particular project, we could not have this moral hazard problems that I mentioned if we could make the investment conditional. So suppose that uh, I am, as an artist, wanting to buy some sort of equipment and asking uh, money in um, exchange. Then it could be the case that with a smart contract, I only gonna get this money that has been arranged if I provide the proof of making this investment of this uh, product that I have uh, set. So after I have sent, spent this money, then obviously uh, I would not have uh, the same moral hazard uh, problem. Uh, uh, there. So of course we can't make all uh, investments, especially if they are not uh, tangible, uh, uh, solved by the conditional payments, but they would greatly help. One can also think of there being like other innovative payment mechanisms to, for example, overcome a strategic obsolescence, because we know that for good uh, strategic reasons, or actually bad strategic reasons, but good for profit reasons, firms often reduce the quality of the objects that they produce. So think of a refrigerator, like there used to be better technology uh, refrigerators sold in uh, in past, and uh, so there is like a tendency for firms to intentionally reduce the quality of the projects to uh, sell more in the future. So for example, if you would imagine that this refrigerator is uh, somehow connected um, uh, to the system and like uh, records whether it functions or not, we could uh, sell the refrigerator by having it effectively more similar to a rental contract or uh, most certainly include a uh, refund in the case that the refrigerator stops fund, uh, uh, functioning, okay? In this case, like the firms that will uh, reduce like the quality of the refrigerator for strategic purposes would not have incentive to do it anymore. But there are also um, potentially additional uh, uh, problems. Uh, because uh, we need to be careful of not changing the rules in a process in a way that benefit new consumers in the expense of the old consumers of uh, any digital pr project. I'm happy to discuss it um, more uh, like um, in later discussions, but there is a big question around like, is it uh, good that uh, many digital tokens are tradable? On, of course, on one hand, it makes uh, things more liquid, but on another hand, there is a demand then for these particular assets that are not driven by the preferences in the target market. So that can model what we learn about it. It can drive the price too much up uh, for the target consumers. And so it's an interesting question about uh, uh, is the tradability of digital tokens good? Should we intentionally make some things less uh, uh, tradable? Okay. And, uh, more things when we have more parties. So overall, like reward-based crowdfunding and related developments, I would argue, is one of the most novel and exciting and game-changing ways of thinking of financing because 
we can also make a, a more traditional uh, fundraising uh, contracts for financial reports, better with these technologies, but uh, what is exciting here is exactly the interaction with the eventual target market directly. And uh, thinking about uh, mechanisms that can actually maintain the creators in uh, investment incentives in this project. So I would argue that it is probably the, uh, on around all exciting ideas is to uh, try to see whether the, uh, in the worst case scenario, the creators would still have an incentive to develop this product or not. And finishing again with the same uh, idea is that if something works with very selfish agents, it is certainly going to work with a less selfish agents even better. Okay, thank you.